Welcome everyone to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited for our guest today, Ty Lopez. Thanks in, for having me, man. In your house. Good to see you, man. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about this and I want to read your bio really quickly for those that don't know who you are. Ty Lopez is an investor, partner, or advisor to over 20 multi-million dollar businesses through his popular book club, which I was on. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and podcasts. Me. Ty shares advice on how to achieve health, wealth, love, and happiness with over 1.4 million people in 40 countries, which I'm sure is bigger now since this bio was uh, posted online. He's appeared on My various- My lawyer says to do it understated. Right, there you go. Yeah, there we go. He has appeared in various TV and radio shows, spoke at top global universities like the London Business School and the University of Southern California, and created one of the top downloaded podcasts and YouTube channels, The Grand Theory of Everything. So again, thanks for, uh, for coming on, man. Thanks, and there's, um, you know, we've known each other for a few years and there's been, we kind of run in similar circles, similar spaces. Yeah. I live not even a half a mile away from you, a yeah. few blocks down. We're at your place here in, in Beverly Hills. And a lot of people ask me to interview you. Okay. Because they have a misconception about you. Yes. And so I think a lot of people have a negative misconception about you. So okay. I want to set the record straight to let people know who you are. Okay. And who you really are. And so I'm curious, the first question is, yes. how would you describe yourself if someone said, who are you? How would I describe, I mean, I think that uh, I am a curious person that likes to try lots of stuff. And if I look back on my life, I think it's easy to uh, lose objectivity when you try to figure out your own life. But if I look objectively at my life, just year to year, I'm kind of like a mad scientist. And so, you know, I've lived with the Amish for two years. I've been to 40 or 50 countries. I've been in finance. I worked for GE Capital, the biggest company in the world at the time. Um, I've been an entrepreneur. I've uh, lived in a mobile home. I've lived in Beverly Hills. And so for me, I think that I'm more interested in trying stuff than any one thing in and of itself. So I was like, a lot of people know me for stuff like Lamborghinis and Ferraris and stuff like that. But that's just some, that's because that's catchy. Mm. So people catch that part of me. Right. I like books. Sometimes people latch on to that part of me. So, you know, it's interesting in terms of positive or negative people. I get a couple, that bio should definitely be updated. I get, Google says I have between 100 and 200 million people who follow my stuff, watch my stuff in a year. And anytime you get that much volume, it's been very interesting mad scientist to see the variability of reaction. So I remember when I was about 20, I read an article. It was, an, and this is somewhat related to, to this book that I know you're working on, on the masks that people wear. So these scientists in National Geographic said, in India, you have massive disparities between the poor and the rich. I mean, you're talking people who make eight bucks a month and people who are billionaires. You don't have, we have that somewhat in America, but you don't have anybody in America that's, they have 40 million starving to death people in India. And they said, how does that happen? Like, how do those people who live near a billionaire not just go knock the door down and take food? And they said, our brain has developed mechanisms of coping with other people's success. And I've seen it in my own brain when I see people more successful than me. And I can't remember, I wish I could find the article, but I was, like I said, when I was like 20. One of the reactions is people think that the person got lucky. This is one common reaction. The other one is that the person um, inherited it. The other one is that they stole it. And I forget what the fourth one, and only the fifth one is thinking, wow, that maybe that person has something I can learn from, that's how they got successful. So only about 20% of the population, in my mind, um, doesn't suffer from delusion. And you call, you know, you were telling me um, on how men have masks, and I think we all have that. I've always called it delusion. Okay. And I think there's a lot of delusion about anybody who gets a lot of um, following, like the Kardashians. I remember, boy, I was at the Laker game a couple years ago and when they were hated, 
Yeah. And Justin Bieber too. You know, he had the most disliked video and people hated them and now they are loved. And, but they're the same people. So this, mis this, this delusional kind of perception um, is what messes the, us up. And I think if you can really see clearly, and this is maybe why I'm a mad scientist, I, I want to see clearly. Like, mm. I've heard people say, money doesn't make you happy. So I lived with the Amish for two and a half years. When was this? That was when I was about 23, 24. How old are you now? <laughs> That's something that I, my, my uh, publicist said I should never say, but. Why, why not? I don't know. Maybe it's one of my masks. What's the, what is about age? Yeah, she says it's Hollywood, never say your age. Why, why is it you think uh, you don't have I to don't share? know. I think that, you know, it's I think. It's not good or bad, I'm just curious. No, I think that uh, in business, so um, I think in business you want to be super honest, but at some things you want to be closed. Why? You know, there, the art of war, uh, the old you know, Chinese book on strategy, or the newer one by, uh, what's his name? What's the guy everybody loves that wrote this book? Oh, Robert, Robert Greene. Robert Greene, yeah. I, I think um, there's a lot of bad people out there, and each person in life will have to cope with people. And when I say bad, a better way to say it is people who don't have your interests at heart. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when you give too much information, People who don't have your best interests at heart will use that against you. What's now, too much age is, yeah, it's a subjective thing. So I think that when the mask, when I think about mask and whether I should have some, I also think it masks, it depends who you're with. Okay. So it's kind of like you could think of it common sense. If you are walking the streets and somebody says, what's your ATM pin code? You're going to want to keep a mask up. You're sure. going to be like, ah. Absolutely. If you're... CPA says, you know, or your mother says, yo, I need to get some money. What's your pin code? You're going to treat them differently. So I think a lot of the masks we deal with come from us trying to estimate how this person does or doesn't have our best interests at heart. So there's certain things like information, like there's people that think I rent my cars or that was a big conspiracy theory when it first came out. A guy saw, when I first got the Lamborghini, it had a little piece of plastic key. So the guy, he said, that's a rental, which is not true at all. I, and for years, I've been like, should I release the title to the car? Because if you release the title, it shows the date I had the car. And I think this month I'm going to release it. So I've been, I've had the mask up that, you know what, do I want to live a life where just because somebody says I rent a car, I have to prove it? Because sometimes unmasking yourself is actually ego. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Somebody, if I come up to you and I go, if somebody comes up to you in the street and says, Lewis, I don't think you're a successful business guy, show me your bank account. Mm. Well, and then some people will go, oh yeah, let me show you my ATM statement. Look, I got this right, many right. millions. That can be a form of ego too. Sure. Whereas my first mentors, a lot of the guys I learned from, guys like Joel Salatin, if somebody said to him, I don't think you have much money, Joel would be like, okay, great. I didn't make my money to try to impress you. He just go on. He just keep walking by that. Sure, guy. sure. So I think that. Um, so how old are you then? <laughs> I always say I'm a fucking vampire. Five hundred. Okay. <laughs> okay. So why do you have a hesitation around age? Though I'm just curious. Again, not right or wrong. I'm just curious. I, you know what? I I don't. Because I've know. always been open about mine. No age. It's not even age. It's like. I always think I'm going to give away the most information that can help people. So people ask Why me. Why would the age hurt people? Well, I, I'll give you an example in general. One of the most Googled things around my name is what my net worth is. I saw there's an article that says something about my net worth. It's not accurate at all. Somebody just wrote something. And I always think... Will that help people if I disclose what it is? And, the, and I don't want to be perceived as, oh, I'm not a Warren Buffett. I'm not a billionaire person. So I don't divulge that because I don't think it would help anything. Same with the Lamborghini. I didn't think it would help. In fact, the way I figured it is by not sharing whether the, the Lamborghini was rented or not, all the suspicious people won't follow me and I don't like them to start with. 
But why show the Lamborghini in the first place if it's not even important to, to show because, it? Because the Lamborghini was part of my life. Mm -hmm. And it was a real thing and it was something I bought before I even ever posted videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so I do think, so, you know, going to where you get negative. My biggest negative. So what's around again, the age? What would be negative around the age? Well, all your personal stuff. I mean, people want to know income. They want to know, because they want to size you up. Mm. So people want to go, okay, that guy's that age. Mm, I don't feel, I, I feel like I'm behind. Mm. You know, it start. I, I've just found that that a level of secrecy around yourself sometimes is okay. And sometimes it isn't. And I think you have to be wise about that, what that is. And everybody draws a line differently. Sure. Like I'm sure there's things you divulge that I wouldn't divulge, but probably vice versa too. Right, right, right. You know? So. Okay. Well, maybe you'll tell me behind closed maybe doors. I'll, maybe I'll come age. behind. Um, <laughs> it's actually not that big of a deal. But, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm just more curious. I figure why. it's an innocuous thing, and all the innocuous things you should keep secret. That's that's what I always. That's figure. fine. I guess I'm just curious because I wonder what's the reason behind it. If you know, I think like telling your age could inspire a lot of people. It's depending. Yeah. If you're younger than people think, like, hey, look what I've created with my age, or look, you can still create yeah, but something. Yeah, see, that's what. Okay, okay, so that what you're saying is precisely what I'm trying to avoid. I often, I have a huge amount of following on people that are under 25, and a lot of them go, Ty, what's your advice to an 18 year old? Well, here's my advice to an 18 year old. Or, and the same thing with women. People go, like, if we could hide our gender, I think we'd help more people. Because what happens is women will see a successful guy and go, well, I can't do that because he's a guy. Mm. Well, age and gender hold most people back. When people are 14. I agree. I think when you're eight, here's how the economy works. Most things we buy now are e-commerce related, meaning we don't see the seller. Therefore, it's the best time ever for minorities, for women, for 14 year olds, for 90 year olds. You add value to the world and create a product that's high quality in the value chain and don't think about your age. So my advice to an 18 year old entrepreneur who's a female and black is the same advice to a 50 year old who's a white guy. It doesn't matter. What you should be focused on is how can you create high quality pro products and market them persuasively. I agree. It doesn't matter what age you are, race you are, yes. but isn't it more inspiring to reveal who you are? But I don't want people to be inspired by that. I want people to be inspired. Well, I think for me, um, I want people to be inspired around accuracy. So what I look for in people, and there's a human bias, there's these 25 cognitive psychological biases that cause humans to meet, make mistakes. There's all kinds of association bias, availability, Kantian fairness, all these highfalutin scientific words. Well, one of these cognitive biases um, is called liking or disliking bias. So what it means is, if somebody we like, Oprah Winfrey, says five plus five is 11, we're more likely to go, maybe it is 11. And if Adolf Hitler, somebody we hate, says five plus five is 10, we're more likely to go, hmm, he's probably wrong. Well, this is a flaw in the brain. You should hate what Hitler did and you should love Oprah, but you should value each point that comes out of somebody's mouth, especially if you're looking up to them, go, is it accurate? So if I say to you, Hey, Lewis, this is how I think you should do Instagram marketing. If you then go, how old are you? See, that's a mistake. Mm. I learned from, I, one of the, I, I learned how to, I have a pretty engaged Twitter. Some person a few years ago DM'd me and said, hey man, I'm the king of Twitter. I'll show you how to do it. I was like, true. Tell me, I'm open to experiment. He told me, you know, post seven times a day. Here's the times, da 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 da. Sure enough, that shit worked. Well, lo and behold, this kid turned out later to be 14. And I'm glad that wasn't the opening conversation because I may, might have said, been biased and go, what's this 14 year old? Yeah, results don't lie. Exactly. So it doesn't matter how old you are. That's right. And I tell people that if they like me or dislike me, because some people, it's actually a negative media, um, it depends. About 99% of people love my stuff. I see, I get tens of thousands of testimonies. It's just negative people will write more. Sure. And so what happens is um, 
I get people who like me too much to the point where I feel like they're no longer judging the quality of my content. They're like, if Ty says it's as good. I don't wanna be that guy, I'm not a cult leader. And then I get other people who will see a video and go automatically go, this guy's an idiot. Well, I'm not a fucking idiot, I can tell you that. And so even if somebody hates somebody's style, I look around at the plethora of, mo of mentors available to us now. Whether it's YouTube, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, I, was, I listened to one person a day. I was listening to Kevin Systrom today, who started Instagram, made a billion bucks in a couple years. Um, I'm like a gold miner, and I'm looking through there, and every person just has to give me one nugget. Mm -hmm. Whether I like Kevin Systrom's app or his right. value or how he talks, I don't care. You get value from everyone. Yeah, you, but, you, but not everything people say is valuable, so you gotta become true, a filter. True. What drives you right now to do what you're doing and to create so much and to grow what you've been growing? What's your driving force? I, you know, I think it's, it's part adventure. I have this thing that there's the four M's of motivation, what motivate us. I actually, I have all these cool mentor guys that I, I now have like built this advisory board. So I try to do one phone call a day with somebody really smart, um, whether it's an author or a PhD or a, and, and there's a guy, um, who is a very famous psychologist and he wrote a book and I said, I got this theory of motivation. He's like a Wharton professor and he listened to it and he was like, I think that's right. I think that's about right. He had a little, few changes and it's the four M's. So you have material things, mating, mating, uh, mating which would come like human relationships. Um, the third one would be you have mastery, which is like status. And the last one is movement or momentum, freedom. And so I think every person you meet for the most part, if they're normal sane humans, is gonna be motivated around that hierarchy. And some people though, other, some things are more important. Like Warren Buffett, he said from seven years old, he knew he wanted to be wealthy. So this is a materialistically driven guy, but he can help the world. I think my order, you gotta know your order. I think I'm most driven by movement freedom. Like I became an entrepreneur because I didn't like a nine to five job. You know, I did it, I tried it, it well, wasn't how, for me. How old were you when you became an entrepreneur? Oh, around 19. 19. And, and I, around- How many years ago was that? What, I don't know, what was that, last year? <laughs> um, when I was uh, 20, uh, I then was an entrepreneur and then I did a little bit of company work at the same time I was an entrepreneur, I didn't like it. Same with going to college. So I think that's my first one and then each person's different. And that's one thing where you get people that don't like each other. I, it's a huge mistake. I see people, and you see this a lot, people go, well, I'm not gonna listen to this person, I don't think they have my values. Mm. Well, all humans have, if they're not criminals, you probably share the same values just in different priority order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hugh Hefner. This is a man driven by, let's say, mating. We could say Hugh Hefner, he liked women. A lot of people, are, if you bring up the name Hugh Hefner, a lot of people will write him off. Well, he's a freaking genius. I just, I, I try to do like once a week, I'll study one person that's well known. I mean, he has an IQ equal to Bill Gates. He's a genius guy. And if you look at his life, you know, he's 28 years old. He was in a marriage that was failing. He was at a bridge and he said, is this it? Is this all my life? I don't, I hate my life. And uh, about a month later, he launched Playboy and it became, mm. you know, it was an instant hit. And he went on to doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, he was the first real figure in America that was, that was um, accepting black people in. I mean, he was interviewing Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. When these people were, or I don't know if it was Martin Luther King Jr., but they were getting shot. I mean, they ended up getting shot. Mm. And he, so we, one of my, um, there's a genius guy Speaking of secretive, I know a few entrepreneurs, in fact, I know about three of them that are, make the most money and they are so secretive guys and I, I get to have a dinner with them once in a while and I was in New York and I had dinner with this guy and he said, just remember Ty, most people can only hold one thought in their head at the same time. So it used to be Kim Kardashian, Kardashians, idiots. Now, Kylie Jenner this month on her birthday said, I'm selling a lipstick kit, 150 bucks for the kit, only 300,000. What'd she sell out in one hour? 30 million bucks, she's 18, she's making, 
She's not an idiot. So now all of a sudden the mind, so now people love the Kardashians. Justin Bieber, there was a time, douchey kid, hate. And so I think that when I think about my motivations and when I see people trying to figure out my motivations, most people want it to just be one motivator. Humans are complicated. I'm complicated. The smarter you are at some level as a species, you can be more complicated. You know, earthworms, they ain't that complicated. Dogs, a little more complicated. We have dogs. You can have a dog with a little more complicated personality. Sure. Well, dogs have about a 40 to 50 IQ. Humans have 100 to 200 IQ. And that's exponential curve, which means we're 100 times more complicated. By the way, which speaks to why I think we have masks. But that's a whole nother. <laughs> what would you say are your top priorities in life right now? Priorities? I mean, uh, I try to keep it simple in my mind. The, I call the four pillars of the good life. Health, wealth, love, and happiness. I try to ha I want to have all four of those. What's missing? You know, I think the ebb and flow. Like, I'll, I think there's times when your physical health you're working too hard and then so you're not as healthy. This is probably the healthiest I've seen you in the last few years. Yeah, yeah. I've been able to, you know, I was doing a lot of work stuff and I balanced a little bit better. Um, but I'm doing a lot of stuff. I think social life's super important. So I think in each person's life, if you're a genius and you're watching this, you'll be able to do it way better than me, which is always hold all four constantly up. Mm. And that's, that's what my thing is now. It's like, how can I structure my life so that all four of those are rocking and rolling. And, and that includes wealth sometimes, mm. you know? What um, is a question yeah. from one of my listeners. Yeah. Um, well, I'm first curious before I ask the full question yeah. is, have you ever been married? No. Okay. Uh, one of the questions is, has the money and the luxury that you, that you live in and the lifestyle you have made relationships easier or harder for you? You know, intimate I, personal relationships. Yeah, I think uh, that if you're not careful, money is like a pit bull, and a pit bull can save your life or it can turn around and kill you. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to dating, you know, if I'm dating girls, if you make more money, have more different status level, you have to be more aware of that because there are, like I said, there are people with, that don't have your best interests at heart. But you know what? I remember when I was poor and there's nasty people too. Sure. I haven't found that to be as big of a deal as people think. I do. One thing that I think you have to be careful of is when you have a major status change in your life. So if you met a girl when you were poor, like Kevin Systrom, and then he became a billionaire, that can be rocky. Whereas if you're Bill Gates and you've been a billionaire since you're 30, he probably doesn't remember what it's like to have to cope. So I think the transition is more, but yeah. What's your vision for a relationship in your life? What do you, what do you want to create? Do you, you see mean like yourself, love, dating, yeah, do you see romance? yourself being married? Do you see yourself having? I think maybe, you know, I don't know that, um, there's this interesting book called Attached by Heller and Levine and we know more now about how the brain works and there's different types of people. There's, it's called attachment theory. So there's secures, there's avoidance, and there's um, anxious. And the main takeaway I take from it, I don't think everybody's gonna get married for 50 years. And my proof is the second you made the world free, meaning women didn't have to be married to men, they could survive economically and thrive without men, the divorce rate went straight to 50-50. And I will bet money it's gonna be 50-50 for the next couple centuries. Why? Because the attached theory has found that about 50% of children, and you can trace it back to toddler age, are secures. So I think the world would be a lot better place if you don't force everybody to get married. I do, I will tell you this, everybody should have love in their life, romantic love. Do you have it? Um, I just broke up with, I was in a relationship for a couple years. Um, so yeah, I think you should have it. I think I'm somebody, I, well, you can just look at my life. I don't think I'll be somebody that necessarily got married at 19 and, you know, died at 80. You know what, uh, Dr. Marina Adshade, she told me, she goes, Ty, people forget throughout history, 
Average marriage is 12 years because people used to die. Wow. So she goes, we're not, D our DNA, we're not, all people thinking you're supposed to be with one person for 60 years, 50 years. She goes, it ain't happening because we're not coded that way. But about, I think 50% of people. So if I had brothers and sisters and, or kids or whatever, I would just look at each person individually and be like, you know what? You're a lover. Right. Get married, stay married. You look at another person, you know what? It's going to be a disaster. And you see that in the world and kids end up getting messed up. I think it's a, it's a tricky question. Hmm. So what do you want to create moving forward? In, in relationships? Relationships? Yeah. Like, what would like be the I said, ideal I, relationship for you? I think you find love and you stay in it as long as it is meant to be. I know that sounds like such a cliche thing. But man, imagine, I grew up with a, my, a single mom. My dad was in prison when I was born. And uh, then my mom got remarried. That marriage was lasted for a while, it was rocky, eventually divorced. You know, Dane Cook, you remember the comedian Dane Cook? I've seen him over at the comedy yeah, yeah. store. Yeah, he's, yeah he's at Laugh Factory stuff. I heard him say the best, most poignant point ever from stage. He goes, why can't we just be adults and get to that point where you realize you're no longer in love and just go, wow, this has been awesome. We've got kids, I'm gonna go live over here. You live over there. And let's always love it. He goes, no, we just let it degrade to the point where people want to murder each other and the kids are in massive conflict. And so I think the mature, I think the worldview is wrong. There's no science that 100% of people sure. are meant to be married what, forever. Then what's your, what's your, what do you want to create then? What's the vision for your relationship in the future? If you could have the perfect ideal relationship, what would that look like or feel like? Or Well, I think... I think you'd be in love and you'd want to be in love. But I, I, what I'm saying is... But what do you want? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. For yeah. me, definitely, I think all people, including me, you should, be, you should have love. I'm just saying, some people it's going to be with one person forever. I understand, I understand, but I'm curious what mine, you want, not what everyone else wants. It depends who I find. <laughs> it depends who if I you find. Could, if you could create the life of your dreams with the woman that you want to be with, I think just, like you, you okay, this, I you, just like you created you this could, lifestyle. Yes, but this is different because it doesn't have our DNA. Okay, let's just say you could. If I could if change my are, DNA? You believe, do you, no, let's say that you could create, <laughs> you could create the, Snap relationship, my fingers. the relationship you want. You could create it. What would that be like for you? What would that look like? Some relationship will be long and some will be short. That's what so I think. So multiple relationships. In my lifetime. Yes. Yes. Okay. In a lifetime, over a course so of a You're not looking lifetime. for one woman to have an incredible relationship with for the what whole life. What you said, life. some could be long. Gotcha. So let's say tomorrow I meet a girl and all, right, and right. you know that it's meant to be, but you know what? All relationships are temporary because somebody dies before the other person. I get it. But let's say, you could, have the, let's say you could have exactly what you wanted though. What would that be? I think not I, like what it could be, but some what long and some short. Okay. So you want I multiple think. relationships. I think that's what I'm destined to have. Okay, but yes. what do you want? I like want. I want my destiny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but look, this is it. here. Let me give you an example. I understand. I'm, but let me give you an example. I, I want to know exactly what you want, not what you think. No, but I'm serious. Thing. I've trained myself to want my what I think I'm built for. Let me give you an example. So you're not built for one person, is what you're saying? Even if it, probably not. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Probably. Awesome. Not. Cool. Um, this is a straight answer. I'm curious. Lewis is good at interviewing. Here's another question. He's going to get the answer from me. Another question. <laughs> Why, here's, if I'm being yeah. honest with you, I feel like you're avoiding a lot of the questions. No, I think... So no, I just want to make sure we're getting to no, yeah, it's good. your thoughts and your ideas and how you really I'm, feel. I'm at, I, the reason you feel I'm avoiding, I think, is because I think some answers are hard. Absolutely. I think here's why yeah. I want to do this interview. Yes. Because I think people want to hear what the real hard answers are to yes. you. Because I feel like from the responses I've been getting when I ask right. people what I should ask you, yes. is they, they feel like you're not questions. authentic. Right. They feel like you're not telling the truth. They feel yes. like you're not, you're holding back. You're wearing something that's Some elusive people. and you're, you're acknowledging it, Some saying do, that you're right, waiting. Right? Yeah. You're not, you know, you're not revealing everything. Let me speak to that for one millisecond. Yes. And I get it because you want to be guarded no, in certain areas. No, 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 no. But I'm going to tell you this. This is my advice to myself and other people. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. The thief will always be suspicious. So when I meet somebody suspicious of me, mm -hmm. it's always a flag to get the hell away from them, not prove myself. If you are ever in a situation where you're dating someone and on the first date they look over to you and go, now I just want to be clear, you ain't going to cheat on me 
If they bring that up, if that's in their consciousness, that suspicion level, they will cheat on you because only thieves are thinking about breaking it. Sure, but if someone so, no, is but, curious to ask you questions about your life because they want to get to know you, that's not a thief. No, but I've found, I because I meet a lot of people. The people who meet, you meet, I meet, you meet, that are going, you know, there's something I don't feel authentic about you. I'm like, are you kidding? I'm. Who's more authentic than me? It's usually a reflection of what they're yeah. missing in themselves. Who has yeah. a camera on me? I'm like, guys, when somebody goes, is that really you? I'm like, I do 150 Snapchats a day. Mm -hmm. You a think lot. this is a hotel? <laughs> Some people are brain dead. I'm like, who's more authentic than somebody that turns the camera on mm, them sure, all the sure, time sure. in an unscripted format? I'm not the Kardashian. I'm not on a set with the right. producers editing thing. I mean, we can edit a little bit, but I'm on live Facebook. So right, right. that's why I say the reason, and I advise anybody, if you get a lot of people asking you, I'm suspicious sure, of those people, sure. be careful of those people. Sure. The thief will steal from you eventually. Okay, next question. Yep. Um, we are in Beverly Hills. This is, yeah. I'm assuming this is one of the nicest properties in the neighborhood. What do you got? I don't know 20 about that. What do you got? 20 bedrooms? This place has uh, 16. Now there is a place. 16 has, bedrooms. There's massive. Guest I'm gonna pools, tell you, guest homes. It's pretty bed, incredible. This is nothing. I but will, it's nice. What's the place we went to, Lady Gaga, the place, my? Oh, Ron, Ron Burkle. Woo! This is Ron Burkle's bathroom. <laughs> But We're this is still pretty Burkle's nice. Bath. It's I mean, I'm looking it at is a, nicer. a pool, nice. cabanas. I am very thankful. Uh, volleyball court, basketball court, yes. tennis court, MMA gym. You know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Giraffes running around in the backyard. Uh, you've got a nice lifestyle. Let's say right. called a luxurious lifestyle. Maybe not compared to Lady Gaga's right. people, but you're in 90210. Right. One of the most, the richest, wealthiest areas in the world. Yes. Uh, probably top 10, right? In the yeah. world, this or area. maybe number one. I mean, number one. Hills is, yes. um, now, what are the hard, what are the best and hardest parts yeah. about the lifestyle that you've created and yeah. also display to your audience? Because you put a lot of it on display. Yes, we were just walking around. You're showing right. your yard, your, you know, your yes. cars, obviously the books, everything. But what's yeah. the best part and the hardest part about the lifestyle you display? I mean, the, the best part is in specifically for this place is being able to live in a city, but feel a little bit like I'm in the countryside because I actually like farms. I lived 10 years on a farm. And so like this place has like grass. Like I've lived in LA, I've lived in New York where I didn't have any money. When I first came to LA actually from San Diego, when I first moved, I was born here but left as a little kid. When I came back to LA, I could only afford, I decided I was gonna live in Santa Monica. I thought that'd be nice, but I didn't have much money. So I rented this temporary place that was like 250 square feet. So what's nice about this place is literally just having some space um, makes me feel more peaceful. And I think if you live in cities, I was just in New York, unknowingly mm. your cortisol levels jump up. Mm -hmm. So, and the hardest part of living here, do, here's the thing for anybody that's successful, I will tell you, tall poppy syndrome, status is a bitch. I just <laughs> read a fascinating article by Dr. David Buss, who may be one of the smartest guys to walk this planet in this century. And he said, he, he wrote about this. Anytime you display status, men especially, women somewhat in their own, women more against women, but men against men, it becomes threatening to some men uh, and stuff like that. And so the biggest parties go, do I want to show that I have a Lamborghini? The first nice car that I got, really, I got a Maserati in like, I don't remember, 2008 or something. From 2008, 2014, and I had a Ferrari after that. I never posted a picture. I posted one picture on my Facebook for six years. So when people think that I got cars to show off, I'm like, in six years, you look on my Facebook, it goes all the way back and shows that you can see the picture. I, and so, so why I start showing it? You know, so that's the good question. So why? I'll tell you why. I can just tell you now. There's not a person in history or a government that has more kids in the ghetto reading books than me. You can hate me all you want uh, around displaying stuff, but what are you doing for the world? That's tangible that you can put your finger on. I, move more, I got more kids interested in reading, knowledge, mentors, probably than anybody in history. If I got to show a Lamborghini for that and you have a problem with that, 
Go fucking change the world on your own, dude. I don't give a shit. That's my honest thing. That's no mask. That's like, great. If you could do it in some other way, you're way smarter than me. But if you can't do it, and you can only complain about how I did it, why don't you learn? Why don't you do your own version of it? If you want to inspire people to rock climb, go do the equivalent of rock climbing. I'm showing people how to do, how to aspire to more, and you got to be practical. You know what motivates people? I had this, my brother had a birthday party in my house. This, when I was walk, uh, when the, it was over, this guy walked up to me and said, man, I'm a school teacher. I'm a friend of your brother, and I just want to tell you the other day, this kid was walking around, and he's like, he's been a juvenile delinquent in and out of jail, whole four years in high school, and I saw him carrying him some books on business. Mm. And I walked up, this is in the inner city of LA, like Compton, I'm from Long Beach, ghetto part. Said so I walked up a kid, and I said to this guy, why are you reading this book? What is, I never seen you with a book. And the kid turned to me and said, Ty Lopez said I'd get a Lamborghini if I read. Now that's not actually what I say, but you see the inspiration mm. there? <clears throat> so you're Trojan horse. Yeah. Bring it, people in with the luxury. But it's actually, this is the thing. Some people would say, oh, so what you're saying is it's a white lie. It's not a white lie. That's how I fucking got a Lamborghini. I read books. My second mentor, Alan Nation, I was 20 on a farm. One morning in Joel Salatin's- Where was uh, this? This is in Virginia mm -hmm. on a farm. I was mentoring on this guy named Joel Salatin and his mentor, Alan Nation, came. First time I met him and he can't, he was the most fascinating person I ever met. And I think at this point he might've been a millionaire, but I never met a millionaire, dude, growing up. I don't think I ever met somebody who made more than 50 grand. My family was not dirt poor. They would have been had it not been for my grandma, but I grew up around people. My, grand, my mom, single mom probably made 20 grand a year. So I had $200 for Christmas growing up. Mm -hmm. Well, when I met this guy, Alan Nation, coming down the stairs, realized this guy's successful, talked to him, and he started quoting from this book. And I said, how do you know so much about this book? He goes, oh, I always read a book before breakfast. I said, how do you remember? He said, well, you gotta train. Mm -hmm. And that's why I learned to read a book a day. And I, from those books, if you read the right books, you get to collect and collate the knowledge of people who have spent a lifetime. And so when I say what I like more than Lamborghini is these books, mm. there is pure where would you be without? Where would you be without reading books? Oh man, trying to hunt down mentors in person, which I do now. See, now I, don't, I do read now, but if I didn't choose to read, I could get away with it. Why? Because now I call the authors. You get the knowledge from the people, yeah. Yeah, but when I was, li I lived in a mobile home in North Clayton, North Carolina. When was this? Growing up as a teenager. Yeah. Okay, I, I, it was a double wide, so we weren't super poor, but it was a fucking trailer. You think if I called up Dr. David Buss and said, will you talk to me an hour a week? No, but I could buy his book. And I could, when I couldn't afford a book, I could go to the library. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to, I mean, what America needs, Here's the problem. The White House tries to do learning initiatives. Public schools try to do learning initiatives where you go to pe kids in the ghetto and you say, yo, read. No, it's not cool. It's not swagger. And if you're in the ghetto, I grew up around all projects and stuff. I grew up in North Carolina and Long Beach, San even San Diego where I was. So a lot of gang stuff. Kids are not gonna lose their swag and maybe get beat up and shot to look cool. But you know what now? The way I do it, millions of people aren't afraid of it because I still have swagger and I do that. And so if, if I make learning knowledge cool and some uppity entrepreneurs have a problem with it, I'm like, shit, you ain't bring no fucking value. Come sit down with me. You don't know jack shit. And so I don't care about those people. There is, is of no consequence. And you know, I often tell my employees, my, one of my companies, we kind of call it Knowledge Society. I said, I want you to know, name a company more important than ours. Name it. Apple? No. Facebook? No. We are making millions of Einsteins, geniuses that in the past rotted in the ghetto. They're going to be found now. And what that will do for civilization is important. So what we're doing is important. So what, underneath all of that stuff, which has an edge to it. And, but it's real edge. There's not one car in that garage that's ever been rented 
There's nothing. Everything people see is literally, and my camera guys are right here. We might set up a scene five seconds before, like move the camera over there, but there's nothing like, right. okay, tomorrow, <clears throat> let's go. Does it matter if it's rented or owned? Does it really matter? No, no, but I'm saying there's nothing. Now, nah, if you rent a Lamborghini for a year, you'd be insane because it'd be about a million dollars a year to rent. No, no, but what I'm saying is there's nothing fake. Hmm. This is my life. And well, the house is rented, right? I mean, you didn't yeah, you, buy well, the house. I, real estate, here's my recommendation. I own lots of real estate. I lease some, own some. My feelings on real estate in general are that we're in a bubble in different parts. Like I'm going into London, I'm going to lease in London. Mm -hmm. London's going to be. So if it's you're an entrepreneur sure. for tax reasons, do what your CPA right, says. Right. Sometimes you're going to lease cars, sometimes you're going to buy them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lease property. Sometimes I do, sometimes I've, you can lease to own sure, stuff. Sure. And, I'm curious yeah. about, so you grew up pretty poor. Um, you had mentors, you lived on a farm. Yeah. At one point you lived with Amish people for two years. Where yeah. was that? That was, What's the, I live in a little bit in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and yeah. the longest in a group in Virginia. It's, it's big in Ohio. I mean, I'm yeah. from Ohio and there's yeah. a lot of Amish people there. So you were there, where, where in Ohio, do you remember? Yeah, I was in Holmes County. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, Homes people with the all little trailers that. and everything with the little yeah, buggy yeah, yeah, yeah. You got home, um, Wayne, and all this. Man, counties. some good. Some good I know uh, some of the language. Some good maple butter, man. It's <laughs> some good stuff. You uh, look like you. Are you German? German? No, no. I'm Welsh and English. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, when did you make your first million dollars, and how did you make it then? So and, after. And how old were you? Yeah, that's. I don't know that the word. It, it was. Uh, a good question people have asked me you know one of the problems with me why sometimes people think that i'm lying about stuff i have purposely built my brain to not care about like milestones mm. i'm so big on that because and i know other people like milestones and i respect that but i'm really um, a person that tries not to think about the past so much so i a lot of times that's why I'm like, when did I get the Maserati the first time? I'm like, ah, I don't remember the year. Um, well, I mean, were you working at a company? Business, were you an no, entrepreneur? No, I was an entrepreneur, for sure. Okay. And when, um, Do you remember when you started this company? What was the oh, company? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, in my 20s, the first thing I did, um, so I went to work for G. So my very first business was when I was five. I started a tomato stand for one day. Didn't do so well. So I folded that business. Lemonade stand the next day. That did better. And then we live in such a retarded world because I was so entrepreneurial, I think, from birth. No one encouraged me to be an entrepreneur again until I was 19. So I wasted 14 years of my life learning about isosceles triangles and stuff in the modern school system. You know, by the way, people that think there's frauds and scams in the world, anything that you think is a scam isn't a scam. A scam is something you don't know. It's a blind spot. Sometimes people go, Ty, is your 67 step scam? I'm like, you want to know what a scam is? Go to the cafeteria at your school. <laughs> right. This is a scam. You got Coca-Cola be given to seven-year-olds. Did they give them Ritalin? This is a scam, my friends, and you don't realize it. And so that's why it's a real scam. A real thief, you don't know he broke into your house. Anyway, um, right, so when <laughs> so 19, I started a business with Joel Salatin. <clears throat> I had a farm. I worked on his. I, I worked on his farm. Sorry. And then I overheard him talking about a neighbor who wanted to rent a farm. And Joel was telling his wife, I don't have the time to do it. And I spoke up and I said, I will run this farm for you, Joel. And, what type um, of farm is this? With like it was a cattle farm. Cow yeah, farm. Beef. And so, but I said, I have no money to buy the cows. It was just empty grass. Yes. And so Joel said, I'll tell you what, Ty. I'll put the money up. I don't remember how much. It was like thirty or 50000 to buy the cows. And at the end of the year, you do all the work, we'll split the money. And um, so I would wake up at five in the morning, work till six at night, and then I'd put a helmet flashlight, drive 45 minutes to this farm, and work till like 10, four hours at that farm, then come home and sleep and do that seven days a week. For it. I did that for a year. In your early 20s? Yeah, I think I was around 19 for this. 19, okay. And at the end of the year, we sold that cows, and I made 12 grand profit, which I thought was an incredible amount sure, of money. You're rich. Oh man, and I took that money, but what I did is I took that money and I traveled the world to find more mentors. And I actually ran out of money when I was in New Zealand traveling and- uh, North Island or the South? I was in Christchurch in the yeah. South. So I had to shear sheep 
to it's save up enough there. money to get out of the. It's beautiful there. But right after there. that, so that was a small business. I'd say the first bigger business, when I came back to North Carolina, my mom was getting divorced again. And that was when I was sleeping on the couch. A lot of people have heard my story. And 20, what happened? 21 years old now? Yeah, it might have been, yeah, around then. <clears throat> and, Didn't go to college then, I'm assuming? Uh, so then I decided I'd try to go to college. I didn't have enough money. I went to NC State. I think I have about eight credit hours probably somewhere at NC State. But I started a little consulting company and uh, I was working at like Starbucks or something. And I remember my first paycheck after two weeks was like $120. And I was like, ooh, this isn't gonna help me very much because my tuition was like 1,000 a month. And, and so um, I started this little consulting business because I knew a lot about land from Joel Salatin, helping people from other countries buy farms in America. And this guy said, if you write me a one, uh, one paper on where I should buy land in America, I'll send you my normal consulting fee. So I did that and he wired me like $10,000 for a one hour paper. And I was like, I want to be an entrepreneur. This is much better. <laughs> I make 10 grand in an hour. Right. So after that, I, st I did that consulting business for a little while and then I started um, I worked for GE Capital, and then I spun off a company with a business partner um, named John DeWar. And I talked, I didn't have any mo much money then, and I talked him into putting in the first 50 grand, and we were 50-50 partners. He's still a friend, and that company still exists. And so we managed money, it was a wealth management company. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time, that was the first, that made business, real money. Yeah, I started getting six figures. And then I was in the nightclub and ran a lot of nightclubs. So I had two things going. I'm a big fan for in people. In North Carolina. Yeah, but I, I was pretty big. Oh, we had a thousand, two thousand people. And that's when I sure. started really making money. Okay. In the nightclub yeah. and in the wealth management yeah. business. Yeah. Early 20s. Yeah. And then and that went on till about, yeah, mid to, eight, to late 20s. Yeah. Do you have a number or amount you're trying to earn? You know, I go back and forth on that. Sometimes I'm like, I don't care. Uh, I'll tell you this. Here's my number that I know that I have. I'm interested in, because now I'm starting businesses or investing. I'm interested only in things that can do 100 million and more or revenue. They don't have to start there. Sure. I believe, I, I call it the rule of 10. So for anybody watching, if you're not an entrepreneur, uh, start out trying to make 100 bucks a month. You can do it while you're doing your full-time job. Part-time, make 100 bucks from an entrepreneur venture. Then once you do that, figure out how to make 1,000. Then once you do 1,000 a month, figure out how to make 10,000, then 100,000, then a million a month, and then you just go up. So I'm at the point, and you don't go backwards. Once you figure out how to make 10,000 a month, don't launch a business that's gonna make 5,000. Right. Then you, and so now I'm at the place where, you know, I'm, I wanna do things that could do nine figures, if I can hit that. Then you try to go after ten what, figures. What would that, what would that figure mean to you? Like I would it? only do it if it's a business that I think is valuable. I see so many businesses that make people a billion dollars that are like, not some of them are harmful for the world. I, I try to stick mm -hmm. with. I've always done businesses that it may be night. Even when I did nightclubs, I was not involved in the alcohol side. Mm. So the restaurant did all. The, I never made a penny in my life from alcohol, right. even though. People were coming to the club and drinking, but I I wouldn't want to try. I would not make a billion dollars by launching a cigarette company or something. Sure, like sure, that. sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, what would the money mean to you once you hit that number? Would it more adventure, man? That's it. That for me, if it's like more freedom. So let's say you make a billion dollars. To me, it'd be like adventure time would accelerate. Like life now, I have adventure. Somebody came to me and go, Yo, Ty, I've got this badass idea for a new health food supplement, I'd be like, well, you got a billion dollars. Now you'd be like, here's a million bucks. Go, let's see if we can make an adventure happen here. Gotcha. So for me, it would just be like all lifestyle related. Don't you feel like you have a good lifestyle already? Yeah, that's what I said. I'm not, I go back and forth. There's a part of me that's super like, oh, you gotta make a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. You gotta make, eh, you gotta make a hundred million. I mean, do you not feel satisfied with the amount you've already made? I do. I. I, I why, I do. why go for more then if you've already hit? I'm not. I'm only going for more adventure. And if the adventure turns into money, then I'll be happy. Mm, okay. No, I, I honestly believe, man, that um, here's, there was a guy here, speaking of the cabanas. I was sitting in the cabanas, much wealthier than me here. And, and I, I think the sh I have a chef and he, the chef brought me food. And he said, why do you waste money on all this stuff? I said, well, 
All the money in the world doesn't matter if you don't know how to spend it. And I have a better life than you and you know it. And I, it was between two friends, so I wasn't cocky. And he laughed because on this street here in Beverly Hills, there's a lot of people just trying to build money and tally it up. I've never been that way. So my goal isn't to have this, it, but my, I like to have a chef because I suck at cooking and the food you eat is a number one predictor of your health. You know that as a pro Absolutely. athlete, even more than working out. You can work out till the cows come home. If you eat shitty, you fall apart, period. Yeah. So to me, I think he's crazy for being a billionaire level guy and not having a chef. I'm like, you cooking sub why wouldn't you want the best, man? Mm. What's all that money gonna do? Like Absolutely. Steve Jobs said, don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard. That's true. You don't <laughs> want to be. Um, a few questions left for you. Yep. Here's one. Um, what do you think of people like Warren Buffett who live in the same small house he bought many years ago? Yes. Obviously, there's people out there with tons of money who don't live a flashy lifestyle. Or, yes. And what's your take on that? Someone like that who doesn't have to, you know, or that doesn't, you know, put it out there. I think, so I think that um, I'm an extrovert and... Warren Buffett a little bit is extrovert, but not really. He's more of an introvert. He, he says he likes to lock himself in his office eight hours a day. That's more introverted. And so when you're an introvert, a lot of what I do, the stuff you see, like a big house here. Yeah. Last month I threw a party, 490 people came. Uh, this house lets me be social. I got a basketball court. We play, yeah, you're yeah. good at basketball. I've got a dojo here. I can have... 20 top Brazilian Jiu Jitsu people come here. So for me, mm. if getting a small house would be a waste of life for me, but for somebody who's introverted, who doesn't want that, and I strongly believe that about half the world's extrovert and half the world introvert, you must know yourself. If you're an introvert, then you want to use your money in much different ways. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, What's something that people don't, who don't have money, wrongly assume about money and wealth? Uh, that it's poisonous or something. I, it, it, there's been a lot of research on unhappy people who get wealthier don't get more unhappy or more happy. You pr your yeah. happiness is in change. But I will tell you, not having enough money is very stressful. But um, having a lot of money can also be stressful yes, for a lot of people. More absolutely. stressful. Yeah. I don't know if it's more stressful. I think you've the fear of yes. losing it, the yes. fear of people taking advantage, the yes. fear of uh, Yeah, you've made a lot of money, so you know you're probably like me, both sides of the coin. I, I think though that there's a myth because and some of it's Judeo Christian that money is the root of all evil. Eh, I think if you look at the statistics, money is the root of all lack of money is root of all evil. If you want to look where the most kids, if you think, you know, what is evil? Well, how about millions of kids starving to death? This only happens in poor countries. Where are women exploited? Mostly, I, the wealthiest country in the world, one of them is Norway. I was just in Norway. There's no strip clubs in Norway. There's zero porn produced there because women are as rich as guys. So they ain't going to do that. Mm -hmm. So the real thing is the lack of money and resources that is the root of all evil and people who become crazy once they get money mark my words if you had met them 10 years before they were probably crazy too warren Buff yeah. buffett was a cool cat before bill gates was cool before. there's a lot of crooks who have money too who are corrupt and you yeah know. that's yeah. what i said it's an it, it's more neutral it's an enhancer. yeah Whatever, it gives you more have. yes yeah. it enhances who you are yes if you're a good person you're gonna be yes. more good if you're a bad person you'll be more bad and i'll tell you I'll, here's a little thing that's been interesting um, one of the coolest things about my lifestyle now is I get to meet a lot of interesting people like you, Lewis, and uh, not too long ago, last month, I was, um, got to, me and Arnold Schwarzenegger, I was at his house, got to chill with him for an hour in his kitchen just talking, and all kinds of interesting people in this last year, from, you know, billionaires to like Rihanna type, Rihanna and stuff like that, and here's the thing because some people think it's name dropping. It's not name dropping. The interesting thing is that the people at the top are cooler. <laughs> They're nicer. Uh, it's the mid-level people you have to watch out for. So one of the main reasons, and I didn't get, going into being successful, this was not on my radar, but it's on my radar now. If I wanted to become a billionaire, which 
I vacillate back and forth between really caring about. I can tell you why. I actually thought about this today. I was reading, listening to Kevin Systrom talk and I was like, this dude's damn interesting. And I was like, maybe I should become, try to become a billionaire because he'd hang out with me if I was a billionaire. Not because billionaires are looking down, but you need, billionaires have to protect themselves a little bit. Yeah. So I think for somebody, one of the myths is that you don't want to become successful because it, it poisons your social circle. No, the worst social circles at the mid tier, that's annoying. Like if you work at a company, it's the mid management that sucks. Mm -hmm. Usually the founder of the business, interesting. It's a risk taker, it's a smart person. People on this block are interesting. The other day, I heard a funny story, I did this party and all these influencers came, it was an influencer party and I sent a bottle of wine we sent to everybody saying, sorry, it's gonna be loud here, I'm having a party. And um, only one neighbor wrote back, okay? And we got, so we have the letter somewhere. And I opened the letter and it said, Ty, it's your place, do whatever you want. Have a loud party, I hope you have fun. Sign, Kirk Douglas. See, the people at the top, Kirk yeah. Douglas. He's the coolest guy of all of them. He sees the world clearly with the least, that's why he became Kirk Douglas. And there are some people at the top that are crazy. You know, Bill Clinton FaceTimed me, uh, what was it, a couple weeks ago? I was driving, Maya said, pull over, I got FaceTime. Maya was with Bill Clinton in Vegas. And so he FaceTimed me. And I'm talking to him, it's just a short little thing. We're talking on his favorite books. It was the most interesting short interview I ever had. Cause it's Bill Clinton. You right. don't get to be two time president and be a moron, or right, usually right. not. Right, right. <laughs> I don't know about our current <laughs> political <laughs> atmosphere. What is, um, let's just say, hypothetical, that you only had $100,000 a year. Yes, that's, income. That's how much you were gonna make every year. It was just like, you were forced to only have 100,000. You couldn't make any more. Yeah. For whatever reasons, some rules, yeah. something happened in the world. That's yeah. all you could have. Yeah. What would you do with that money? Dude, I would try to set up how my life exactly how I have now. I wouldn't be able to do it exactly, but I, I would try, like, my lifestyle, sometimes I'm like, don't mess it up, Ty. <laughs> and, and, and it doesn't take as much, like, I spend, you know, I spend now $100,000 a month on mentors a month, traveling to them, doing stuff, you know, whatever related, and so I would scale everything back, but I would keep every element that I would literally do my best. So for example, but you can take the last 24 hours. What did I do in the last 24 hours? I had jujitsu with Higa Machado. Well, I can afford now to pay them to come private. I would just go to the gym. Right. <laughs> but I would keep jujitsu right, in my right, life. Right, right. I have a you know a weight trainer. I like I play basketball. I would go to the park. I have I went out, we went out to a comedy club last night. You can afford, if you make a hundred grand, you can afford to go to car. Improv is 10 bucks right, a right, ticket. Right, sure. I brought a lot of people and bought everybody food. I would just make everybody pay for their own. Right, of course. But I'm saying, you still have the same that's lifestyle. the litmus test that I think we should all hold ourselves to. And, and let me just say this last thing, because this speaks to your concept of masks. There's a great, I forget who did this science study, but there's two ways you can consume as a person making money. There's conspicuous consumption and, and inconspicuous. And conspicuous is what makes you unhappy. So, I don't have any nice watches, okay? And some of my friends are like, you should have a Rolex because if you are successful, you need to show that. Well, I don't really care about watches, never did. So if I bought a watch, for me, it would be what's called conspicuous, me trying to show off. Inauthentic. Yeah, so I don't do it. You like the cars, but, but I'll tell you, you like this. Them. Yeah, if the world ended and there wasn't one human on the planet, just like that Will Smith, what was that Will Smith movie? Legend or something. Yeah, I'm Legend. Yeah. He went and got a Mustang. Well, that was product placement. I would go straight to the Lambo dealership and turn that bad boy on to have myself a Lambo alone on the planet. Why? It, have you ever driven a Lambo? No. Oh, uh, you and you drive <laughs> one. You drive it once if you like power, it's just. There's nothing, I drove a Bugatti. I know the CEO of Bugatti. He let me drive one. Oh, this thing. That one is actually too fast. So Lambo is perfect. Right. You don't need 1400 horse. <laughs> but my point is, sure. that's inconspicuous. Right. I would try, if I only made 100 yeah, I grand. I don't wear watches or yeah. jewelry or anything. If I made 100 grand a year, I wouldn't be able to live here. 
but I would live in a house that had these elements. I'd make sure it had- you Live in the guest house of someone who has the Yeah, house. or I would move back to North Carolina, mm. where for a hundred grand goes a lot income, you might be, oh, for a hundred grand You're income, king. you could have a backyard this big. In North Carolina. You could have, yeah. you could pour. On a lake. You know what I did when, when we were poor growing up, uh, middle class, my mom got remarried. So as I got older, there was another source of income. My stepdad worked at the post office. He wasn't rich, but we had this little house. We had a house, 2,000 square foot house, or whatever, and there was woods in the background. And for Christmas, he convinced the neighbor, he didn't have much money, to get a bobcat, you know, a little piece of equipment, and knock 20 trees down, and then pack down the dirt. And then they poured, we poured cement, and I had a bas full court basketball. Mm -hmm. We could only afford one light, so you could only see at night. The light would point one way. So, and that, so that whole court was built for zero dollars. The neighbor did it. So if sure. I only had a hundred grand, I'd be like, how can sure. I get my free basketball court? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, a couple final questions. I appreciate all the insights. Oh, thanks for, for, being, for being open. Putting up with my, uh, <laughs> my uh, what is it? I'm closed, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you most grateful for in your life recently? Um, any, I read a book on luck and anybody who's successful should uh, thank God for all the luck you've had. And uh, you could have been born and you could have been born with a disease. So I try to, that's why I say, I try not to go, people go, do you think you're successful? I'm like, I try to not even entertain those thoughts. I try not to go, I'm successful, I'm not successful. There's that great poem by Rudyard Kipling called If, and it says, you know, if you can meet yeah, triumph and disaster and treat those imposters both the same. To think of your life as triumphant or disastrous is the waste of your life. So for me, I'm just grateful that um, moving forward, that's what I want to do. As long as I'm moving forward, mm. I'm grateful and I'm grateful that I'm healthy, that good people around me and stuff like that. So I'm, mm. I'm grateful for it all, man. What's the, I feel like we could all be better human beings. There's always yeah. a way to become better. So what's something you feel like you could be better at to be a better human being? <laughs> Probably more patient, Maya. What do you say? My cousin there is smiling. Yeah, I, my friend has that band company where you put like a band reminder around you. My and, intent or? Yeah, my intent. So mine said patience. Mm. Uh, here's how I think about doing good. I, I came up with this simple agreement with myself, which was I call the 50-50 rule. I've tried to live where you live 100% for others in the world and you just lose motivation because we're inherently somewhat selfish. So I, I, I try to live my life 50-50. So I go, 50% of my life I live selfishly. Like, if I want a Ferrari, Lamborghini, I'm gonna do that. But I have to counterbalance my mm -hmm. selfishness with 50-50. I've tried every variation. I've tried to live 100% for myself, where you're like, fuck it, everybody, no, don't worry about anybody else. And I've tried to live the other way. And that 50-50, ever since I stumbled upon that thought, has been one of the big breakthroughs in my life. life. How much yeah. would you say you'd, you'd donate a year to charities or things that you value? Or? See, this is something I'm not, see, not, just to be fair, I am secretive about some things that you think I should tell. I don't think I, you should or shouldn't, I'm just kidding. No, but about age, but I'm also secretive on how much money I give because I feel like if I say, then I'm giving money for the wrong reasons. I'm giving money to show off, but, mm. I will or if you look at it as an inspiration and look how much yes. he gives. Which it's funny you say that. So, so I look at it from a positive yes. standpoint as opposed to Yeah. I'll say I'll say this. There's one thing on public record, because I did a matching thing. So you had to know how much I gave. So Heifer Project, which is one of the biggest charities in the world, I did a million dollar matching. So I gave a million. Right, Maya? They raised two point five million. And we matched. Yeah. So that was a couple of, But I do more than that. Um, my goal right now, I'm giving away a million dollars worth of stuff to followers. Obviously, that has some help because it helps my social media. Yeah. But I, but how important is giving fi financially to charities or things you believe in? How yeah, important super is, important. I think. Do you think we all should do that? Yeah, I, I mean, ideally, I know it's crazy. Um, I think you should do that 50-50 rule. I think you can give away. Even the U.S. tax code, you can give, you can deduct up to fifty percent of your AGI, your adjusted gross income, for charity. So I think a good goal. I'm not quite there yet, but uh, I think if I could set up my life, if you make ten million bucks, if you make one million bucks, if you make a hundred thousand, give half away. It's tr tough, 
but it'd be a cool life. It'd be another adventure sure. to test. So that, that's the, I'm not sure how far away I am from the goal, but uh, maybe that's a good goal. What do you want your epitaph to say? <laughs> he was a mad scientist and, and some of the stuff he said was important. <laughs> how about that? Okay. <laughs> Um, Not all of it's important. You can ignore about 90% of the stuff I say. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'm winning by sheer volume of, <laughs> of ideas. Where, uh, before I ask the final uh, question, where can we connect with you online? Uh, probably, you know, a good place is Snapchat. If you're not using Snapchat, if you're older or younger, use Snapchat. It's a fascinating um, tool. And of course, Instagram now has Insta Stories. So it's at Ty Lopez for both Instagram and Snapchat. Um, if you want to get my book summaries, you can just go to tylopez.com. I've got a book of the day email. I think I got the biggest book club in the world. I did a TED talk, my TED or a TEDx talk. I think it's going to be top four of all time. Right now it's top mm. 12. Uh, but yeah. And what are you most proud of that you've done in your life? <sighs> most proud of? Like single thing that I did? Sure. I just got my blue belt in jujitsu. <laughs> I was kind of proud. That was about the most proud of myself I've been in a while. Right. Jiu-jitsu is a bitch if you haven't done it. <laughs> so if you meet somebody who's a black belt in jujitsu, yeah, if I can if I can keep getting belts in jujitsu, I think that's about as mm. proud as I'll be. Okay. All right. Um, oh well, no, I got one more. Sure. Played Chris Paul on horse, got him to a damn standstill. He had to play for two hours. Wow. <laughs> Anything good. basketball related? If you look on my Instagram, I nailed a shot on Meta World Peace right on a, who was the NBA defensive player in the year of the year. So all that kind of stuff is yeah, that's yeah. where I'm the cockiest <laughs> on the basketball court. I grew up playing basketball on the projects. That's, cool. that's where my true uh, cocky side comes I'll to, out. I'll have to come play sometimes. You're soon. good. He's we'll, good. We'll, see. we'll have to play. Um, before I ask the final question, I want to acknowledge you, Ty, for, for opening up, for sharing some more things that I don't feel like you've shared before, and for uh, doing a lot of good with what you're doing. I feel like by, by showing the lifestyle, I think a lot of people have the misconception that you're egotistical or cocky or who knows, but I think after listening to you, knowing that your mission is to inspire the youth who aren't educated to read more books so they can potentially have a better life, whether that's this lifestyle or just a better life for themselves. Right. I think that's some great stuff you're doing, so I want to acknowledge you for that. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I, I want to thank you. It was a good interview. Yeah, you're yeah. good at this. Thanks, man. You should make a podcast. Man. <laughs> and you should teach people how to do this because you know how to do it. Last question. What's your definition of greatness? My definition of greatness? Uh, I think on everybody's grave, it should be able to say it was important you were here in some way. Mm. We're not all going to be, I can't be Einstein. He was important, but mm. you lose track of that. You, I think you lose meaning in life. And so some people are going to be, but you got to be important. And, and the sad thing is a lot of people, not only are they not important, but they're detrimental to the world. The world would be better off if they weren't mm. there. And so whether you're a parent and stay at home, mom, stay at home, dad, be important. So that someday somebody looks back and goes, Thank God that person was here. Mm, mm, I like that. Ty. Actually, wait. Yeah. I forgot. I apologize. Yeah, no. I always ask a question at the end and I completely forgot. Okay. It's called the three truths. Three truths. Okay. So at the end of the day, many, many years from now, it's mm. your last day. Mm. And not everything you've ever created has been erased. Okay. But you get a piece of paper and a pen to write down the three things you know to be true about your life, your experience in life that you would pass on. That's only what people would remember you by, those three things. Okay. What would be your three truths? Um, so number one, be aware. Remove the delusion in your life. And I was explaining that if you meet somebody who's more successful than you and your ego wants to go, this person's a jerk. Look clearly, be aware. Are they really a jerk? Or maybe they know something you don't know. Mm -hmm. So that'd be number one, be aware. Number two, um, you only learn from mistakes, but they don't have to be yours. That's what Warren Buffett said. So learn the reason I read, the reason I believe in mentors is I can shorten the path. 
by letting them make the mistake and then just tell me, oh, Ty, don't put your hand on the stove. Okay, I never have to do that. And then the third one, I would say is this 50-50 rule. Don't completely live for others and don't completely live for yourself. If you live too much for others, you'll lose motivation because we're a little bit selfish and we need to be a little selfish. But if you only live for yourself, you become disconnected from humanity. Mm. So. Awesome. Ty, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks so much, Appreciate man. <laughs> Hey guys, Lewis Howes here, and thanks so much for checking out this video and this interview. I hope you loved it. If you did, make sure to leave a comment below and share this with your friends. Also, I've got a huge announcement. The Summit of Greatness is coming very soon. If you love the School of Greatness podcast, if you love these interviews and you want more, you want to connect with some of these speakers in person, you want to connect with me and other people just like you who watch and listen to these interviews, then make sure to sign up for The Summit of Greatness. Go to summitofgreatness.com to learn more. You can check out more about the video that we have that we created for the summit. There's a link in the description below as well. It's summitofgreatness.com. Check it out right now. I hope to see you there. And again, thanks so much for watching this video.